The last year brought a number of new cybersecurity challenges for organizations as cybercriminals attempted to exploit the surge in remote working. But they won't be stopping there. And as we move forward into 2021, cybercriminals will continue to evolve in an effort to find new ways of taking advantage of security vulnerabilities and making money. I'm Danny Palmer. This is ZDNet Security Update. And with me to discuss the cybersecurity challenges facing organizations this year is Kevin Curran, IEE Senior Member and Professor of Cybersecurity at Ulster University. Thanks for joining me, Kevin. So, what's the outlook for this year? Well, I think we're going to just see more ransomware attacks. We're going to see more data breaches, and we're going to just see a lot more compromises because, of course, for cybersecurity experts, again, we have to secure every single vector of attack, where the cyber criminals only have to get lucky once. Again, so denial of service um, attacks are becoming much more popular because now the criminals can demand ransom through cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And again, that there's tools out there like low orbit ion cannon and high orbit ion cannon, which can overwhelm the site with a lot of traffic and bring any ordinary site to its knees in just a few minutes. Again, because the problem is an IP request looks the same. You cannot really distinguish between whether it's someone really trying to surf on your website or whether it really is just fault attacks coming in. And then, of course, the, these are being used, these denial of service attacks are being used by compromised Internet of Things devices again. So these are anything from webcams to um, wireless kettles to um, even chastity belts now are actually being hacked again. But all these devices can be used to, to be bombard sites with too much traffic because when a request comes in, a server sets aside a certain part, a part of memory and then it expects that it will service that request, that session. But of course, nothing ever comes through then but false, other false requests. And again, and it just, again, runs out of memory. And then, of course, the real people trying to get onto that website, of course, are denied service again. Now, you can, there is services like Cloudflare, actually. And, you know, Cloudflare are, one of, are, are actually the site which routes the most traffic in the world. Cloudflare tra uh, routes more traffic than Facebook, than Google, than anyone else, actually. And, of course, only people in the tech sector know who Cloudflare are, and they have certain services which you can subscribe to. And so does Google offer some of these services as well. And some of these are for human rights, some organizations which come under a lot of attacks um, as well. But generally, your average organization cannot cope with that. And so denial of service attacks are a real problem because, because of cryptocurrencies. Because in the past, only people would do that for maybe fun or just for you know viciousness. But now you can make real money on doing denial of service attacks. You just you just contact a company and you say, look, I'm going to bring your site to its knees unless you pay me X number of Bitcoin. And here's a test. And then the site comes down. And then, of course, it's up to you whether you want to pay it or not. So we're just going to see more of that. And the problem is people buy Internet of Things devices again. So these cheap things which are out there. And of course, we install them. We put them up. Some people don't change default passwords, default usernames. There's lists online where you can check a particular device, you can go to websites like Shodan, which kind of scan the internet for all these Internet of Things devices, and you're able to see which ones are available. And it's very, very easy, again, because a lot of these devices, again, are released, and they don't fix the updates because they're just trying to make a quick book. So again, there is no onus on the people who sell Internet of Things devices to actually have a roadmap for security updates. Again, we have roadmaps for security updates from the likes of our operating systems, like from Google, from Microsoft, from Apple, of course, but this doesn't apply to manufacturers of cheap Internet of Things devices. So what we need is legislation, like was brought in in California. So we have to force manufacturers to provide a roadmap for security updates. We have to hold them accountable for that, and we have to have legislation which protects the public again, which forces manufacturers to provide security updates for a number of years again. We're not saying forever, but for the useful lifetime, at least of a device that you buy, that they should actually roll out updates whenever zero day exploits are found or any security patches, and they have to patch those devices. And that is a problem. Back there already, and with DDoS attacks, you've seen the damage that they can do. You know, go back a few years to the uh, Mirai uh, botnet attack, which ended up taking down you know, vast swathes of the internet. I remember that day I couldn't use my PlayStation, I couldn't sign into these online services. It was really weird just because of you know, all these online things that we're used to having you know, at the touch of a button 
were all down because of one big DDoS attack, which um, even the, some of the biggest companies in the world uh, couldn't handle the traffic of. And it was caused by compromised, or in many cases, by compromised IoT devices. There are things which technical people can do, like BCP, network ingress filtering can help again against flooding attacks. And But again, these are technical things and most organizations do not have that knowledge or capability to do that again. So it, it, it's hard to see how we end this again, because again, just with the rise of cryptocurrencies, again, we're entering a new era where people can make money by doing denial of service attacks again. So again, we're just, it's not going to be addressed in the next 12 months again. But of course, we, we always have, you know, we're always trying to stay one step ahead of the criminals again. And it's a cat and mouse game. And that's just cybersecurity again. And again, it's a poison chalice if you're the chief security officer for any large organization. Really, It's just a matter of how much of your data will be breached in the future, how much will be leaked again. And um, again, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult to get management to pay for cybersecurity when things are going OK. But things which have helped are GDPR, or the new general data protection regulations from the EU. Again, which again, if, if data breaches occur, again, companies can be fined up to 4% of their turnover or up to 20 million, whichever is highest. So again, fines are actually putting the onus back on management again to provide and to take care of the data, to take care of, you know, of, of just managing our data really, because data is the new oil. Really. And again, we're seeing data leaks all the time. And at the moment, it's pretty much the wild west, but until we have proper legislation, Again, we're just going to see more increasing, you know, denial of service attacks. And one you've alluded to here, which sort of combines both these subjects of IoT and uh, denial of service in a way, is the, this story that's come in the last few uh, weeks about internet connected chastity belts, because that's a thing now, apparently, uh, being held for ransom for Bitcoin, which just goes to show that it's one of those things where if, if it's connected to the internet, and it's not secured, uh, cyber attackers will find ways of taking advantage. And it's not necessarily just adding it to a botnet for, distant, for uh, DDoS attacks. Yeah, exactly. And there's also, you know, the chastity belt one was quite funny again, you know, where they actually were locked and people were um, advised to take angle grinders, really, <laughs> you know, to sensitive parts of the body, really. Um, but we've, we've also seen sex toys being used as well. Um, again, that there's been leaks there where people were able to tell, you know, it's a, when someone uses a sex toy, for instance, because, the, you know, that they were, they had terrible security, a lot of these sex toys, which were, again, internet connected, again, you know, <laughs> why was that ever internet connected? But again, there's just everything that can be connected is being connected and people are just not thinking about it. And again, we're going to see huge um, data breaches down the line again and just some sensitive uh, information leaking. Strangely enough, one thing we haven't seen yet it really is from an ISP, an internet service provider. We haven't seen the logs of individuals again because people sometimes think that they take steps to protect the privacy online and go to websites and they, they use maybe um, incognito mode within the browser. But that doesn't, that doesn't hide it from the ISP. All incognito mode does on a browser is, is not just keep a track of the sites on your local browser. But internet service providers know the traffic the sites that you visit. So we're going to see some, I think, very cringeworthy leaks in the future from ISPs. That, that's one of the things that you know, cyber attackers uh, prey upon is uh, that the, 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 the fear around privacy. Once people are aware that um, things they're doing online aren't as private as, as they think, think they are. I mean, we've seen you know, all sorts of things where you know, cyber criminals you know, leak personal data, names, addresses, passwords, um, email addresses, that sort of thing. But there's also there's also elements where we've seen um, attacks where the, and, and ones where there's been a bit of a resurgent in recent weeks, you know, uh, sextortion campaigns where they'll claim to be uh, you know, someone who has hacked your webcam and has seen certain things and are demanding Bitcoin. I mean, it, it might not necessarily be the case that you know, they have done this because uh, they've just you know, taken those passwords from a, a, a dump somewhere but that sort of uh, fear is something that um, strikes uh, worry into people and they go, okay, fine, I will pay this um, you know, $500 in Bitcoin. So this isn't uh, leaked to my friends. And it's a, quite a scary prospect. And the psychological element, uh, attackers know that works, unfortunately. 
It is indeed. Yeah, that, that was the phenomenon last year where where attackers realized that they used the, the the public data breach dumps online where people's email addresses were linked with their passwords. And then they started sending emails to those people, obviously with the email address and said, look, at this is your password. And of course, we know people reuse passwords and people were scared. A lot of people emailed me over those particular emails because some of these people were actually people I worked with who were quite, you know, knowledgeable. And they were scared because they hadn't seen that before. And then obviously I just told them what it was, that it was just a data breach that they'd found online. It was a clever technique, but that did worry a lot of people. And that was an effective um, spear phishing campaign um, very much again. And that's why um, the wonderful Troy Hunt um, and his have I been pawned.com website is fabulous, a fabulous free service where everyone should register their email addresses. And whenever there's a data breach, and just a few days ago, I was in another data breach where, you know, my email alert and password was leaked. And of course, I get an automatic email from Have I Been Pwned telling me that there was a password leak in that side. And of course, what you have to think about is, did I reuse that password in either side again? Because credential stuffing is where if there's a password leak on a website, even if you don't have a credit card associated with that website, the problem is the hackers can go to websites where you have your credit card associated, maybe Twitter or eBay or PayPal. And of course, lo and behold, X number of times out of 10, that you will have, people will have reused the same password on that website, and then they're into your account where you might, have, might not have two-factor authentication, which is very important. Multi-factor authentication is where you get the, you have to authenticate on your phone or some device you have, again, and that's best practice again. But those spear phishing techniques, which we're using data dumps, were very effective for criminals here. And you know, as you mentioned, data is a currency for, for these uh, uh, people, and they are exploiting that in a, uh, another way uh, recently, in that you know, they are combining ransomware attacks with data leaks, saying you know, you know these, th these uh, cyber criminals have compromised their entire network, and they're going, look, we have your data, pay us, or, and we'll give you your decryption key, or if you don't, and if you don't pay us, we'll leak your data, which is adding another, um, you know, more leverage to, to, to these attacks you know, as cyber criminals continue to evolve in order to, you know, most effectively uh, make money, which they are doing because this is working. It is indeed, yeah, you're right, that they, that they are leaking, they are, that they have compromised, they've extracted the data documents, and then that they say, look, we're going to leak some of it and they can prove that. And that's very effective as well, yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, most of the information online has been moving to the cloud. There's a huge paradigm shift where everything is moving to the cloud because of the lower cost, of scalability. You know, it just for for most organizations, it just, you just can save money by moving to the cloud. But the problem is, of course, of course, everything's in the cloud then, and um, that's the problem. There's just uh, there's one particular movement, and it's called the Solid Project from MIT, and it's led by Sir Tim Berners Lee, who created the World Wide Web. And it's a wonderful project, again, because Tim knows the problems with the World Wide Web more than anyone. And again, what, what they have come up with really is pods, where his vision is now that we store our data in pods, and then we can share it with the likes of Facebook or Google or you know whatever social media sites we have, but we can pull back the data whenever we want. In other words, that we grant access to third parties to our data but whenever we want to stop sharing that data, that we control it, that they can no longer have access to it. And again, so he's seen, I mean, this Tim Berners-Lee more than anyone knows what needs to be fixed and what the problems with the web, what the World Wide Web are. And um, again, he's got other people working on this project, like, you know, and there's also Inrupt, which are um, an organization which are kind of commercializing the pods again. And they have some wonderful people involved there, like Bruce Schneier probably the most famous security expert in the world, and he's on the board of directors of Inrupt. So he's behind the project as well. And I, I'm a believer in the project myself. I believe that that is the future. The problem is whether we can get an, enough people to do that, to, to buy into the vision of this again, because again, the problem there is really the data sharing and, 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 and the ontologies again, and trying to get companies to work and have a standard. So, a lot of the work in the background at the moment is trying to create a standard for the data sharing. But to be honest, it really is the way that we can control our data being, and that we put the, we put the control of data back into the hands of the public, back into our hands, really, rather than just giving it to the companies all over the place. Because right now, for instance, I've just changed my address last week. I sold my house. 
So do I have to go to every single website that I'm registered with and change my address? Whereas if I had a pod and they were extracting data from my pod, I just have to change my address once on my pod. And then my address is automatically updated on all the websites which use my data. We've touched on uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, what are some of the other things that uh, organizations and individuals can look at doing to he help keep themselves safe online? Um, because you know, something a multi-factor authentication can be very effective uh, at stopping attacks. Of course, and it's just all the best practice again, you know, using password managers again, not reusing your passwords in different sites, um, you know, using, well, you can say, I'll just be safe surfing really, you know, I mean, as we say, um, um, the only way to remain safe online is not to buy a computer, not to buy a device. If you do buy a device, don't turn it on. If you do turn it on, only visit, you know, one site or whatever. But in other words, the broader your footprint online, the more sites you visit, the more services you subscribe to, the more the, the more applications you download, the wider your footprint is for hackers to get through again. So that is the problem really again. But of course, if you practice safe computing, you don't go to torn sites and you don't, you know, you know, it, and it's hard to get, because only experience gets that over time. I mean, only a liar says they were never taken in by a phishing site. Only a liar says that. Everyone has clicked on at least one phishing email and, you know, and every so often because they also evolve as, as well. But it's just, it's, it's constantly you just keeping up to date again because it, again, just because it's a cat and, and a mouse game again. And of course, you know, and when it comes to cloud security again, my particular security area is homomorphic encryption. And a subset of that is searchable symmetric encryption. And again, that's where your data is never, you never provide the keys to a third party cloud service provider, for instance. Your data is encrypted by your private key and you never share it with a cloud provider. And again, this is only possible of late because you think, well, okay, I can encrypt my files and upload them to a cloud service. And of course you could do that for years. But the problem with that is you can't do any processing on that data because the data is encrypted. It's gobbledygook. You cannot do any processing. You cannot do any mathematics on it. You cannot do any updating. But symmetric searchable encryption allows you to do that. It still allows you to upload your data to the cloud not give the cloud provider the key, the private key to it, but still update the data and perform searches on it and still keep it all completely anonymous. And again, and that is the gold standard of, of cloud computing again, but we're in the early days of that again. And that, that's my vision. That's the part of what I'm trying to build again, is people to come along and start to use um, symmetrical, um, symmetric searchable encryption again. So that that means that now there can be no leaks because you hold the key. And again, it's putting the onus back on the private individuals, the organizations to keep the keys themselves. Because again, the easiest way to hack, look at Donald Trump's Twitter account there lately was hacked, right? But that was one of the most guarded Twitter accounts in the world. Again, but it was still leaked. Why? Insiders. Again, if I want to hack someone and someone comes to me and gives me enough money and they want an individual hacked, okay, I'm not gonna go and pay a million quid for a zero day, you know, like Zerodium and these sites which pay for them because they, they work for governments. No, I'm gonna target an individual in a company and I'm gonna pay him, someone who's just, a, who's got access to the database, someone who's just a low skilled, probably part-time student or student working part-time for the company. I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna pay them small bucks and I'm gonna get access to that, to, to that, to the keys, to that, to that account I want. Humans are always the weakest point. But if you have homomorphic encryption, then, and then they can't do that you cannot target insiders. A lot to think about there. Uh, thanks for joining me, Kevin, on ZDNet Security Update. And for more information on how to stay safe online and how to keep your organization secure from cyber attacks, be sure to keep watching ZDNet Security Update. And there's plenty of information on ZDNet as well. Thanks for watching.